Camel milk, synchronicity and crop circles. All quotes from Mental Models of Reality, written by Dream. So, this morning I woke up at four o'clock. And I just couldn't fall asleep again. So, I decided to have a camel milk instead. And just read a bit. So, I lit a candle. And why I am mentioning this, you see here in the background. This is the wall of my bed. I have a high bed. And those are all pictures. Here is another one and another one. And all show different artworks of the Tor or Glastonbury. And as you will see in the video, this is a synchronicity. So if you want to know what this is about, just keep watching. Mental Models of Reality by Dream This is more book reading quotes from my Zen Mind Balcony. This is a very interesting book. I wanted to do a separate video on this one. Again, I start with the end of the book, kind of as in Chinese tradition, the autistic model. Autism is not a disorder in and on itself. It is a different cognitive state, in my opinion, and from my perspective, obviously. Unfortunately, in my experience, being neurologically diverse, amongst the neurologically typical, created numerous comorbidities which are disabling. This book serves to evidence the experiences, memories and thoughts of a single individual diagnosed as being on the autistic spectrum, suffering an autistic spectrum disorder. I could imagine only a handful of people will ever read this book. I would also imagine that out of those who do, the majority will see little to nothing of value. Mm. I hope not. It's such an interesting read. I would like to think there may have been at least a few words amongst the thousands which either exercised one's mental faculties or brought amusement. I appreciate my unique thought process. May not appear to be of benefit to mankind. However, I relish it at times and had my environmental factors differed slightly I may not be here spouting theoretical nonsense, as did our friend Einstein. I may have been an experimentalist and created practical applications from my mental models. 
Tesla, I believe, was such a character. 1,000 of documents were seized by the FBI upon his death and remain classified as of this writing. Yeah, this is a very strange thing. I believe he wanted to share it with everybody. But they just seized it, keeping it. I'm not saying I could have been Nikola Tesla. I most definitely could not. What I am saying is, I think Tesla was autistic. I also think, had he realized the forces he were up against when he met Thomas Edison, he may have devised a plan instead of naively blowing forward. Apparently, there is an old joke. When you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. I think it's a play on when you've met one, you've met them all stereotype. Just because my neuro Logical diversity may not appear of use, does not mean there is not an equally crazy autistic fool out there now or in the future who will synthesize all the laws of physics into a simple comprehensible model, which has a practical value. Personally, if I were to choose to hold another belief, it would perhaps be that mankind will be saved from the human race by someone who doesn't think outside the box, but by one who sees no box. Neurotypicals need the neurodiverse. They need to recognize the value of what appears as discordant thought which may in fact create a harmonious concordance. I think it will be an autistic mind whose mental model shows a practical path. Intellectual property, ownership of thoughts. I did get onto the idea that perhaps our thoughts may not be quite as our own as we think, but did not expand on to my thoughts on intellectual property and copyright. Perhaps best not to leave it open to interpretation. Or I could say I don't believe in intellectual copyright and perhaps the fictional character Citizen Smith may have said, come the Revolution Brothers, those who've stifled and suffocated the spreading of ideas to the proletariat through claimed copyright infringement, will be first up against the wall. Last fag, Bob, Bob, Bob. Now, would that conditioned childhood memory be considered more of a communist or a fascist inclination? So, I still believe that giving credit to whom credit is due because if somebody put in the effort and the time and went researching and put together all the material, I mean, this is the legwork that needs to be acknowledged but apart from that so agree with this when you think of the collective unconscious as in Jungian psychology it is a part of the unconscious mind shared by a society a people or all humankind that is the product of ancestral experience. According to Jung, 
the collective unconscious is made up of a collection of knowledge and imagery that every person is born with and is shared by all human beings due to ancestral experience. Though humans may not know what thoughts and images are in their collective unconscious, it is thought that in moments of crisis the psyche can tap into the collective unconscious. The old saying goes, lightning doesn't strike twice. And not only is that incorrect in the natural sense, but apparently it's way wrong in the metaphorical sense. Because, as it turns out, some of history's greatest ideas were not only thought up by two different people, they were thought up by two different people at pretty much at the exact same time. So that's why I think they tapped into this collective unconscious. In fact, it was Dream who pointed out this video to me, My Stroke of Insight by Jill Bolte Taylor, and I read her book by now and it really clicked for me. Our right human hemisphere is all about this present moment. It's all about right here, right now. Our right hemisphere, it thinks in pictures and it learns kinesthetically through the movement of our bodies. Information in the form of energy streams in simultaneously through all of our sensory systems and then it explodes into this enormous collage of what this present moment looks like, what this pro present moment smells like and tastes like, what it feels like, and what it sounds like. I am an energy being connected to the energy all around me through the consciousness of my right hemisphere. We are energy beings connected to one another through the consciousness of our right hemispheres as one human family. And right here, right now, we are brothers and sisters on this planet here to make the world a better place. And in this moment, we are perfect, we are whole, and we are beautiful. My left hemisphere, our left hemisphere, is a very different place. Our left hemisphere thinks linearly and methodically. Our left hemisphere is all about the past and it's all about the future. Our left hemisphere is designed to take that enormous collage of the present moment and start picking out details, details, and more details about those details. It then categorizes and organizes all that information associates it with everything in the past we've ever learned and projects into the future all of our possibilities. And our left hemisphere thinks in language. It's that ongoing brain chatter that connects me and my internal world to my external world. It's that little voice that says to me, hey, you gotta remember to pick up bananas on your way home. I need them in the morning. It's that calculating intelligence that knows, that reminds me when I have to do my laundry. But perhaps most important, it's that little voice that says to me, I am, I am. And as soon as my left hemisphere says to me, I am, I become separate. I become a single solid individual, separate from the energy flow around me and separate from you. And this is a portion of my brain that I lost on the morning of my stroke. And I look down at my arm and I realize that I can no longer define the boundaries of my body. I can't define where I begin and where I end because the atoms and the molecules of my arm blended with the atoms and molecules of the wall. And all I could detect was this energy, energy, and I'm asking myself, what is wrong with me? What is going on? And in that moment, my brain chatter, my left hemisphere brain chatter went totally silent. Just like someone took a remote control and pushed the mute button, total silence. And at first I was shocked to find myself inside of a silent mind. 
but then I was immediately captivated by the magnificence of the energy around me. And because I could no longer identify the boundaries of my body, I felt enormous and expansive. I felt at one with all the energy that was, and it was beautiful there. And then all of a sudden, my left hemisphere comes back online, and it says to me, hey, we got a problem. We got a problem. We got to get some help. And I'm going, oh, I got a problem. I got a problem. So it's like, okay, okay, I got a problem. But then I immediately drifted right back out into the consciousness, and I affectionately refer to this space as La La Land. But it was beautiful there. Imagine what it would be like to be totally disconnected from your brain chatter that connects you to the external world. So here I am in this space, and my job and any stress related to my, my job, it was gone. And I felt lighter in my body. And imagine all of the relationships in the external world and any stressors related to any of those, they were gone. And I felt this sense of peacefulness. I could not identify the position of my body in space. I felt enormous and expansive, like a genie just liberated from her bottle. And my spirit soared free like a great whale gliding through a sea of silent euphoria. Nirvana. I found nirvana. And I remember thinking there's no way I would ever be able to squeeze the enormousness of myself back inside this tiny little body. But then I realized, but I'm still alive. I'm still alive, and I have found nirvana. And, and if I have found nirvana and I'm still alive, then everyone who is alive can find nirvana and I pictured a world filled with beautiful, peaceful, compassionate, loving people who knew that they could come to this space at any time and that they could purposely choose to step to the right of their left hemispheres and find this peace. And then I realized what a tremendous gift this experience could be. What, what a stroke of insight this could be to how we live our lives. And it motivated me to recover. And again, that's why copyright infringement mm, is a bit strange of an idea when you think that everybody can tap into this pool of consciousness. Uncanny instances of simultaneous invention. Sometimes inventions are invented by several inventors around the same time, or may be invented in an impractical form many years before another inventor improves the invention. So the microchip was invented twice within a year. Jack Kilby left and Robert Noyce Wright independently invented the microchip within a half year of each other in 1958 and 1959, respectively. But only Kilby lived long enough to receive a Nobel Prize for the invention. Prokop Divish and Benjamin Franklin both discovered the identity of electricity and invented the lightning rod only five years apart. Franklin came up with the rod in 1749, whereas Divish came up with his in 1754. Takaaki Kaita in Japan and Arthur B. MacDonald in Canada independently proved that neutrinos have mass. They shared the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics. In 1902, Leon Desserance de Bord from France and Richard Assmann from Germany discovered the stratosphere just three days apart from each other. They arrived at the same conclusion 
despite using different scientific approaches. Two people from different countries developed the automated teller machine separately. Barron first deputed his cash dispensing machine in 1967 at Barclays Enfield. He kept it a trade secret. In 1968, Wetzel came up with a similar concept on his own. His idea came about while he was waiting in line at the bank. He had his design patented in 1973. Oxygen was discovered by two people in the span of two years. In 1772, Carl Wilhelm Scheele was the first person to isolate oxygen and he decided to name the element fire air. Joseph Priestley discovered oxygen in 1774 and he is often credited with the discovery because Scheele didn't publish his discovery until 1777. Both Sir Frank Whittle, a British engineer, and Hans von Ohain, a German physicist, came up with the first jet engine independently and while serving on opposite sides of World War II. The two met after the war ended. Ten days apart, Edmund Wilson and Nettie Stevens submitted papers that formed the modern view of chromosomal sex determination. Even though Wilson beat Stevens to the punch, her discovery was a bit more on point, as she noticed that females have XX while males have XY chromosomes. Lothar Meyer and Dimitri Medelev discovered and published a periodic table of elements a year apart. Neither man knew of the other's work or legendary beard. The early television had multiple inventors. Each came up with their own version in the 1920s, but not all of them took the limelight. John Logie Baird, fellow fansworth, Kenjiro Takayanagi, Charles F. Jenkins, Vladimir Zvorikin. By sheer coincidence, the film projector was developed almost simultaneously by the Skladanovsky brothers in Germany and an American Civil War veteran named Woodville Ladham in his team. They were both unveiled in 1895. Singular duality, inherent sereness. This was something again which I shared with Luke. It suddenly became clear to me some years back that the dualistic nature of this universe was so obvious and apparent to everyone it was taken for granted. I'm not sure where or when I heard the phrase conditional boundary. But I think the guy was saying that three was the first whole number. It was of interest to me because of the Taoist philosophy and my love of the Tai Chi Tu, more commonly called the Yin Yang symbol. It dawned on me that for every duality which exists, there must be a division to create the apparent opposite. A conditional boundary, which may well be invisible, but must be there to separate black from white, up from down, heads from tails. I also noticed it was possible to think that if it is true that all polarities are opposing expression of the same thing. It is possible that in our three-dimensional world, 
three is the smallest whole number. I ended up creating perhaps my first and last haiku and found myself writing a little nonsense rhyme too. Not divided created one and inherent two makes three. The law of fives is nothing more than seeing three's duality. Page 85 Dream writes Lazy versus Efficiency One of my lifelong crosses which irks me to this day is the accusation of being lazy. Do we look at nature and the universe and call it lazy? I think not. We look at the universe and say nature conserves energy or nature wastes nothing or energy takes the path of least resistance. Nobody looks at a river and thinks water is so lazy. It can't even be bothered to flow uphill. I would also add that the brain uses more energy than any other organ, requiring over a fifth of our caloric intake, according to Scientific American Back Into a Weight. So I would suggest thinking is hard work. I would agree. The natural world is a completely amazing, self perpetuating, self delighting, extravagant, unnecessary, wonderful thing. <laughs> or I would say system with which we interact and towards which our right attitudes are not those of grasping but those of awe and gratitude. First of all, uh, may I say that I don't particularly like the word the environment. Wordsworth would never have said the environment never betrayed the heart that loved it. He said nature never betrayed the heart that loved her and nature is unique personal living of course uh, in order to help you understand the situation in afghanistan uh, if you are a military leader um, you've got to understand how populations move between these principles but again that's a rather narrow view next slide uh, <laughs> it's this bit here uh, this amazing concoction um, was presented to general mccrystal as an analysis of the field in which he was working his dry comment on it was, when we understand that, we will have won the war. Which, uh, <laughs> but it comes from the, the linear perspective. I mean, although it is a system, if you like, it's not really a system like any of the things that live, like human beings and their worlds, which is what we're really talking about. You can't possibly be helped by this series of arrows into connecting things. What a great strategist does is to know a few important salient things intuitively out of a mass of other things and constantly to be revising them, changing and responding to them, but not doing an analysis like this. Now, um, next slide. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the right and left brain because, well, I got to. Um, and <laughs> I want you to put out of your mind everything that you think you know about the differences between the right and left hemispheres because it'll be entirely wrong. Um, unless you read my book. So, <laughs> uh, uh, and so I use this very helpful slide which comes from the internet and uh, I've entitled it Right and Wrong because it's um, a load of bollocks. And <laughs> the, the, there is actually one thing on the slide that is correct, but only one. And there's a free pizza for anyone who spots it. Next slide, <laughs> before somebody claims the pizza. Now, <laughs> this is what your brain looks like. Uh, for those of you not familiar with looking at brains every day, it's a bit like a walnut. It's got a great big divide down the middle. It's sort of wrinkly on both sides. And there's a band of tissue at the bottom called the corpus callosum, which is that uh, in the middle there. The brain has been drawn aside uh, to reveal uh, the corpus callosum. The guy's not looking too happy about this process. Uh, um, but then he died a long time ago. Um, but uh, what I want to point out is that this is actually a rather small connection. And when I was in medical school, nobody said to me, 
Uh, I wonder why the brain is divided. The question was simply passed over. In fact, I've never heard anyone ask it until I asked it. Um, because it's a rather odd thing to do. If you want um, uh, computing power, which I'm afraid is the model uh, that's often bandied about by neuroscientists, I mean, I reject it, but nonetheless it'll work for the moment. If you want to do uh, things that require and get their power from making connections, and that is what the brain is, a mass of connections, that's really all it is. And if you want maximal power out of it, why put a whopping great divide down the middle? And only 2% of neurons actually communicate directly across the corpus callosum. So that's rather odd. And over time, we could have got rid of it, but we haven't. In fact, the division has got more pronounced with evolution, not less pronounced. Um, next slide. Um, and what I'm going to suggest is that each hemisphere it doesn't do a thing uh, like reason or maths or writing or, you know, as people used to say, or emotion, you know. Um, uh, the left hemisphere, by the way, is not reliable, boring, but at least, you know, unemotional. It's entirely irrational. Uh, it's highly dangerous, and it's also very emotional. It gets very angry very quickly. Now, the reason you're not aware that these two neuronal masses are generating two experiential worlds with different qualities is that it's all going on at a level below consciousness. In fact, if it was going on during consciousness, you wouldn't survive very long. So there is a center here in the midbrain, that's the top of the, the brain stem, which is uh, uh, at the millisecond to millisecond level controlling where information is going. And I, I should stress that um, all the brain is working all the time. And it's not, nothing in nature is a hard and fast division. So what I'm going to say um, is set out uh, at some length in the book. It took me 20 years to write. And uh, I'm, what I'm going to say to you today is quick and dirty. So if it sounds a bit simplistic, um, cut me some slack. Right, next slide. And this is really just to show you how massively each hemisphere is interconnected. There are these long uh, tracks, which are rather like super highways, which are um, myelinated tracks. Myelin is a white substance that uh, is a sheath on nerves if you want them to uh, conduct particularly rapidly. So these are highly efficient tracks that knit each hemisphere together. So if you think, we can't talk about a hemisphere on its own. Well, no, you can't. But in fact, they are very, very highly interconnected, each hemisphere within itself. And they make quite coherent existential worlds. Uh, each of them uh, is enough on its own to maintain consciousness. You could have one of your hemispheres removed and you would still be a conscious being. However, the world would have changed radically depending on which hemisphere disappeared. Next slide, please. And that's really, uh, I'll gloss over it rather quickly rather than go into it in any depth, but basically what it's showing you is that the brain is fundamentally asymmetrical. Um, it's broader at the front on the right. I'm afraid because of a tedious anatomical convention, the right is on the left and the left is on the right. So this is the right hemisphere over here. And it's broader and bigger at the front on the right. And it's broader and bigger on the left towards the back. And we heard all about this in medical school because it was said to be the language center. And that was the clever thing that the left hemisphere did. In fact, that can't be right because orangutans, bonobos, chimpanzees also have it and they have no language. Uh, also, we now know that the right hemisphere contributes to language anyway, and so the idea that you had to just get it crammed all under one roof isn't correct. And we know from endocasts of skulls of pre-linguistic man that also there was this enlargement. But also wasn't what was not referred to in medical school was that the single most asymmetrical part of the brain is in fact the right frontal cortex. And that wasn't referred to because in those days the right hemisphere didn't do anything. Now, can we have the, the next slide? What I would say about that, incidentally, is that every single thing you can measure in the brain is asymmetrical. It's different between the two hemispheres. So they're different sizes, weights, lengths. They have different patterning, sulcal gyral markings on the surface. They have different white to gray matter ratios. They respond differentially to, to neurotransmitters and to endocrine, neuroendocrine hormones. So they're not, in measurable terms, which scientists like, at all similar to one another. Well, at all. 
of course, they're very largely similar, but they do have quite distinct um, measurements. And that's just a puzzle because, of course, all neuroscientists gave up thinking there was any difference between the right and left hemisphere a long time ago because it figured in management seminars where people told you to release your right brain. And, and that is tacky. And um, so uh, they kept clear of it. But what happened was, can you move on? That's, sorry, that's the book. That's just a subliminally thing. If you go, <laughs> if you, if you go to uh, Amazon or whatever, you invest the best £10 pounds, uh, of your life. No, next slide. No, sorry, next slide. That's that, that one, yeah. So uh, when I came to look at this, I was fascinated by um, a whole lot of things, which sadly I haven't got time to go into right now. But I did wonder a lot about what the differences were partly because a colleague of mine had written a completely amazing book, um, which came out in 1990, the OUP, my colleague John Cutting, and it was called The Right Cerebral Hemisphere and Psychiatric Disorders. Well, that was fascinating in itself, because, as I say, when I was in medical school, the right hemisphere didn't do anything. Um, and I went to a lecture he was giving and learnt that it did all kinds of fascinating things, which I'll be talking to you about shortly. However, while the human neuroscientists were going tacky tacky, the, um, uh, and just knew that there couldn't be any difference, um, the behavioural scientists looking at animals and birds did what I always thought scientists were supposed to do, which was to observe, and uh, uh, they saw that birds and animals seemed to use their hemispheres um, for different purposes. Now, how would you know that? Uh, well, um, in most animals and birds where the eyes are placed on the sides of the head, it's pretty much true that the left eye feeds to the right hemisphere and the right eye feeds to the left hemisphere. Because as you know, in the brain, everything's sort of crossed over like that, almost everything, except olfaction. Anyway, um, so uh, it's not true of us, by the way. Um, it's because we've got eyes on the front of our heads. That's because uh, when we're swinging from branch to branch, it's rather useful to be able to judge distances very, uh, very clearly. And for that, you need eyes on the front of your head. It's also not true of predators like cats. But for, uh, for us, it's the left visual field of each eye, left eye and right eye, that goes to the right hemisphere and vice versa. Anyway. So um, this uh, handsome chap is the common wall lizard. And the reason I've put up a picture is that even at this level, you see some fascinating things. For example, if you put an eye patch over the uh, uh, left eye of this creature um, and present it with a predator, it will, instead of turning around and looking at, the, looking at it with the, the right eye, it will continue to try to use the left eye, i.e. right hemisphere, um, even though it's patched. Um, and what was this about? Well, this is my hypothesis, and I don't know a better one. <laughs> to be fair, nobody else has suggested a better one, I think. Uh, uh, there we are. Um, <laughs> if you are a bird or an animal, you have to solve a problem of survival, um, which is how to eat and stay alive at the same time which is not a problem in central London in 2017. But it is a problem if you are a bird, for example, trying to pick out a seed against the background of grit uh, on which it's lying ahead of your competitors. You need to have an extremely sharply focused, narrow beam attention to that detail. But if you're only paying that kind of attention, um, you will end up uh, being somebody else's lunch while you're getting yours because you need to have a completely different kind of attention at exactly the same time, which is a broad, open, sustained, vigilant attention for all that may be around you in the, quote, environment. So, um, and this turns out to be what animals, all the animals, birds, fish, everything that we have um, observed has a tendency it's not an absolute thing, but it has a, a remarkably significant tendency to use its left hemisphere, and therefore right eye in these creatures, to look at tiny details and grasp them in order that they may be used. So to pick up a twig, to build a nest, to get your prey, to catch your seed or whatever it is. But at the same time, they're using their right hemisphere, left eye, to look out for everything, um, for predators, yes, but also for mates, friends, conspecifics, 
Um, and it's with the right hemisphere that those judgments about relationships occur. And if you want a quick and dirty sound bite, um, I would say that broadly speaking, the left hemisphere enables us to use the world, which is seen as a lot of fragments of things that we can exploit. And the right hemisphere sees the whole picture in which things seem very different. And I'll unpack that a little bit now. Generalist versus specialist. It is not unreasonable to say the specialist thinks deep, the generalist thinks wide. I am not the word smith, which I once perceived myself to be. However, when I say through division of general science, we are creating specific fields. Please accept, I have put much thought into that statement, and the capitalized words each have meaning in and of themselves, whilst also in context. I think of myself as a generalist. I may give the illusion of depth, but I am shallow. The specialist, on the other hand, thinks deep and hard until he knows his subject field, like the back of his hand. Wait a minute. Is the other hand the right hand? Is it back to front? Is special really special? And does general have military significance? I digress. So now, in the knowledge of never being able to do justice to the original idea, I have created a severe dilemma. I have absolutely no interest in writing some sort of self-promotional, autobiographical, ego-inflating story about my life. However, at the age of nearly 50, I can honestly say in the last year, I've verbalized a number of times words along the lines of I've gone down the rabbit hole, through the looking glass, and found myself in some freaky episode of The Twilight Zone. <laughs> we were trained in many principles of manipulating minds, although it wasn't thought was that title such as the Maxim tell them they can't have it and they want it, which genuinely cited the biblical model of Eve with the apple in Eden as proof of concept. One model employed was AIDA. This stood for Awareness, Interest, Desire, Action. First, people have to be aware of the existence of your product then you have to make them interested in it. Next, you have to make them desire it. And finally, make them act on that desire. The psychology of marketing is something else, which again, looking back through the lens of life's learning, I see as almost horrific. The truth is out there, or is it in here? I should also note here my thoughts on the word belief, a maxim I mentioned to Luke, which I attempted to live by. However, it is a generalization and therefore cannot be true. Trust no one, believe nothing, deny everything. Some readers may recognize this phrase from the early 90s TV show The X-Files. Due to my failing to realize until the age of 42 that people do not live in the arena of debate as I had previously thought, I had inadvertently been creating conflict. One time when I thought I was debating with my dear friend, for the first and last time I actually experienced an animosity towards me. That phrase about starring daggers comes to mind, 
I could feel an anger emanating from their eyes towards me. It was a most unpleasant experience, and particularly confusing as they had appeared to me to suddenly become irrational for reasons totally unclear to me. What I've come to conclude might happen is that under certain circumstances, if one holds an idea in their mind which they believe, there appears an emotional or subconscious need to defend said belief. Whether or not the above postulation is true, I came to think all beliefs contain a lie. At least if one breaks the word down, does the lie f? To me, it does not appear that opinions have the same emotional need to be defended against, almost as if they hold less weight, have less mass, lack the gravity, which perhaps is why opinions also appear easier to change when one is countered with any evidence to the contrary. For decades I had failed to recognize people's emotional attachments to their arguments, merely feeling confused when another party became irrational and angry for no apparent reason. Other than I had found a claim I could question or perhaps thought I perceived a logical flaw in their argument or maybe just saw a small hole in their thought pattern, which I could poke a metaphorical stick into. So when I say I believe nothing, the reader can infer that I have no emotional need to defend an argument I may be presenting. I may even be playing devil's advocate for entertainment and educational purposes of either myself, others or both, and that I only have opinions, I have also learned from others that I can appear to have an emotional attachment to a topic, speaking with speed, fervency and raised pitch, along with my manic mannerisms when talking about certain subjects. What a thing is, is what it is for me. It's not something out there that just exists and we've got to find out what it is. Everything, we have affordances, we have ways of using it, thinking about it, looking at it, relating to it. And that's not to say we can't be make an effort to see it from other people's points of view. In fact, the more points of view you can see it from, the better. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, uh, if it's true that uh, what you uh, tend to changes what it is that you find there, and I believe that profoundly to be true, something follows from this. If you think of the world as a machine, you will start to see machine-like elements in it, because that's the way you're approaching it. And so you will think, oh, the machine's a very good model. And then you use only the machine, and then you only see the parts of the world that are like a machine, not the parts that are not. But if you saw the world as a living, flowing, dynamic, perhaps conscious entity with which we are intimately related, you would find all sorts of evidence of that in the world. What that means is that where you jump into this hermeneutic circle, um, I like this picture of Escher's of hands because it shows that there is no proper place of starting this. You have to jump in with an intuition about what sort of a thing you're dealing with. But where you jump in will govern what it is you find. Can I have the next slide, please? So we harden up a picture of the world over time. We make a first guess, we find things that respond to it, that hardens it up, and so we get stuck in a particular mindset. And my thesis is that in the West we have got very much stuck in the mindset of the left hemisphere. Now the left hemisphere, remember, has a kind of uh, narrow beam attention to something that it wants to grasp, and in fact it's the left hemisphere that controls the right hand with which we grasp things, and it's also the left hemisphere that controls the bits of language, not all of language, that enable us to pin things down, as we say. I've grasped it. Now, the next slide, please. 
shows that this way of thinking suggests that there are separate entities which cause one another, that A leads to B and so on, a conventional Newtonian way of thinking. But if you think the attention of the right hemisphere can reveal something, could we have the next slide please? It's not so much that A leads to B, but that um, there's something very, very complex and living and very large here that you can't simply pick apart and hope to understand the whole thing that you're looking at. Psychology Today writes about synchronicity. Synchronicity is a phenomenon in which people interpret two separate and seemingly unrelated experiences as being meaningfully intertwined, even though there is no evidence that one led to the other or that the two events are linked in any other causal way. Though many people perceive signs or spiritual meaning in synchronistic events, most scientists believe that such events are more likely coincidences that only seem meaningful due to aspects of human thinking, such as confirmation bias. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, this is the left hemisphere dominance saying that, but then when you have those events where you really, really didn't plan anything and it just happens so miraculously fitting together and you really could not have planned it that way. I just believe from all that I have experienced in my 47 years um, that there is a collective unconscious and you can indeed just tap into and things happen. Understanding Synchronicity The concept of synchronicity was developed by psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Carl Jung in the early 1900s. Jung himself believed in synchronicity, which he defined as meaningful coincidences. He wrote extensively about the concept. However, most scientists today consider the idea that coincidences are meaningful to be non-scientific. Instead, many argue that factors such as confirmation bias offer a more compelling explanation. People seek out information to support their ideas and ignore information that challenges them. That is true too, yeah. But it depends from which hemisphere you are looking at it. From the right hemisphere perspective, all is one. From the left hemisphere perspective, you compartmentalize everything and see the details and more details. Why humans seek meaningful patterns? It can be easy to spot patterns that don't truly exist. Why are people so susceptible to this tendency? Experts theorize that from an evolutionary perspective, pattern recognition was likely beneficial for survival. Ancient human ancestors learned to predict possible threats. For instance, they might realize that predators appear 
at a particular time of day, so it's safest to stay hidden. Humans impose structure and meaning on their lives. If they come across two events that seem related, they might categorize them together, even if there's no objective relationship between the two. Why do I see patterns in everything? The human brain is designed to identify patterns. While this tendency can be useful, it may lead someone to overinterpret a random occurrence or perceive a pattern where none exists. Individuals vary in their tendency to recognize patterns. Those who ascribe greater significance to patterns may be more likely to notice them. Oh, this is just oversimplified. Um, so many times, and really, very often, and it seems so very random and I could never predict that. So, I may read something in one book and then I click on a random video, okay? I start watching the video and then in the midst of that video they talk about the exact same thing that I read in that book by chance and this happens to me all the time really all the time yeah anyway so let's look what dream writes about synchronicity a Jungian model of synchronicity by holding a fatalistic belief, as mentioned earlier, and by denying the concept of random actually existing in this physical realm, it follows that coincidence cannot exist either. Obviously, we are able to observe things which coincide, either spatially or in time. Incidences coming together, but their Literal coinciding cannot be chance, or for lack of cause. At some point in the 90s, I discovered Carl Jung and his theories on the collective unconscious, describing events which seemed a causal to be actually causal on an unknown level. Therefore, he used the word synchronicity to describe coincidences, or if he didn't, I do. <laughs> so, on the midsummer solstice, my birthday, I found myself pondering the question, how did I end up here? Skippy Sue and I shared strange experiences and events which coincided in either space or time, but which to me were too extraordinary to be considered coincidence. For example, one day we were having quite a deep discussion regarding crop circles and their potential relationship to consciousness. And I pulled out my necklace and said, this is what I want to see in a crop circle, the yin-yang symbol. The very next day, on 7th July 2007, the first yin-yang crop circle pictograph was reported. Some years later, while Skippy was doing her master's degree in counseling and psychology, we were discussing Carl Jung 
synchronicities and archetypes such as Neptune. Suddenly, Skippy blurted out, I want a crop circle too, a snake, a rattlesnake, in that shape of an S, and I remember interrupting her with, Whoa, whoa, don't be so specific, you've put a snake out there into the eater, leave it at that. Three days later, the crop circle below was reported. <laughs> Amazing. I get goosebumps from that. Another synchronicity to come from my crop circle above, which appeared on 7707, is that my friend's funeral was 7760. The following day, I searched to see if any crop circles had been reported and knock me down with a feather. Next to Stonehenge, important as I was born on the solstice, was a seven-pointed star in a crescent moon, surrounded by a circle containing dots. I recall one layer of them added to 73. I felt compelled to post an Instagram. I also recalled the position of the crop circle next to Stonehenge. I could only think of one other which had ever appeared there, and that was the Julia set fractal. This was the most amazing of crop circles, for many reasons, one being its proximity to Stonehenge, which, as established, I resonate with due to the date of my birth, whilst another of the reasons is perhaps more profound still. This is one of the few temporary temples, as Steve Alexander describes, these beautiful serial glyphs, which appeared between the daylight hour of 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. in 1996. I googled it to remind myself exactly when it was. It was only on the 7th July 1996, wasn't it? I had to post another Instagram. Everything is connected. Whilst preparing to print this book, I suddenly realized that if it were to be published, potentially I could be creating copyright problems due to my use of the crop circle photos. I started to search the internet to find who owned which photos. It appeared they were all from a gentleman named Steve Alexander. The name was familiar to me and as I started to ponder I remembered why. The first crop circle pictures I purchased back in 1994 were from the very same gentleman. This is from my personal Facebook photo album Avebury Crop Circles and Stonehenge 2016. Um, I actually went to Glastonbury to participate in the template ceremony and on the last day we went to Stonehenge. This is from afar and a bit closer up. And we also went to Avebury. Very impressive energy. And we were so lucky to see a crop circle in original. So those are my own pictures. Here we are walking inside the crop circle. And it is really fascinating, the patterns.
Amazing, isn't it? You see how big it actually is. But you don't see its original shape that close up. It's best seen from the air. And this image was taken from a helicopter, I think. This was the same crop circle we went visiting. So you could say this is also a synchronicity because this is the same image. Look at the date. Look. Seventh O seven sixteen. That's when I was at this crop circle. <laughs> this is really bizarre. So Dream writes another synchronicity to come from my crop circle above which appeared on 7707 is that my friend's funeral was 7716. Nine years to the day and Skippy was gone and if one considers 6 plus 1 is 7 then there is another pattern. Numbers don't lie. I'm just not sure we have the capacity to interpret them or use to predict. What it all means, I don't know. It's just really a very interesting synchronicity to me. I was inside that very circle, feeling its energy. I have no idea what this means. Fact is that Dream and I, we have found it surprising that so many things or the videos we watch on YouTube, the same channels we have in common. Yeah, hmm, interesting. This is the Tor in Glastonbury. Another very special place. This is close to our place where we stayed.
and this is me in the grass close to the tour during a break while we were at the template ceremony it was intense so when I felt I just need to go into nature and be without anybody just by myself and this is one of those very sacred moments since in this video the right hemisphere state was described by Jill Bolter Taylor and Ian McGilchrist I also want to add this picture because it is really a sacred moment of mine so as I was in the grass I felt loved unconditionally by Mother Earth and I felt her presence I felt this love of a mother this embrace feeling one with her so connected and I felt so much gratitude and this was the one time in my life I really felt this motherly love I will never forget it but I'm sure this was thanks to a right hemisphere state and being in nature can really do that to you you come out of this left hemisphere chatter and you experience this connectedness with everything harmony and it's so beautiful I will never forget it winter solstice artwork by the same artist from Glastonbury Sandra Brank